Welcome, friends, to the Enduring Gifts of Marvin Gaye podcast, brought to you by your 26-year listening veteran, Jessica. Join me as we celebrate these enduring gifts, the songs of Marvin Gaye. In each episode, I will share insights about the music and recount life experiences tied to it. I'm hoping to inspire you to take a first or your 500 first listen to these songs that are truly the enduring gifts of Marvin Gaye. Hi there. So I have a story that I want to share that will I will liken to Marvin Gaye and I will liken it to basically the experience of the album what's going on my sister has a just about yeah he just turned three months old I think the the time that I'm about to um, recount he is like days over three months old and he is absolutely adorable he's her second baby and her first baby is my absolute little angel. He's just my the apple of my eye. And so he and I have a really, really close bond. And so I'm auntie, right? I'm not mommy. So it is different for me. And even to where <laughs> I have just known that, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, my little angel, you know, that's already a few years old now. It's going to take me some focus to you know just really bond with his his little brand new brother right because I don't get to see them all the time and whenever I do get to see them for several years now right it's the focus and experience has always been about playing with my little angel so I was over there just four days ago or so and the the little baby now the little pure little angel just a pure little angel um, he's sitting on my sister's lap. She's holding him and my other little angel is off playing with his little Legos and he's, he's actually going back and forth with stuffing this and that little stuffed animal into his, his tube for his Legos, just trying to experiment with how many he can fit in and how much he can fit in. So like a lot of activity is going on with just babies, right? Just baby activity. And I'm actually also hand in hand with that on my phone because I'm trying to show my sister um, little bits and pieces of my podcast uh, and all of like I've mentioned before the various platforms that I'm trying to get set up to just spread the word about it. And at a certain point, I notice my little baby is really, really, really talking to me and and like trying to talk to me like he's really trying to engage with me so I put the phone down right like that's a very big part of this day and age right is just putting the phone down so I put the phone down and all of a sudden my full focus and attention was on interacting with this little brand new little pure angel and I got eye level down with him because, you know, she was sitting on my sister's lap. my sister and I were sitting on the couch and, you know, there was a little um like a little cup holder, little table in between us. So I got down and like I put my my chin on my hands onto the table so that I was eye level with this little angel because she's sitting him upright, of course, but that's how tall he is, is that I got to get down to onto my hands onto this little table to be eye level with him. And so I just started having an eye level little interaction, little conversation, right, with this little pure little angel. And as I started to do that, I mean, we are really connecting. We are really um, having a conversation because he is so reactive, right? He's smiling and I'm talking to him. I'm really talking to him and engaging with him and responding to him. And I'm telling him because I can see like he is just wanting to be involved too, right? Like he's just wanting to be seen and heard and, and be a part of all of this little um, chatter that was going on in the situation 
And so I just started to talk to him and he, I could see like he would just kind of be, you know, blithering onto me. And then he's smiling as he's, you know, telling me all this stuff that he's telling me. And I just said to him, I was like, oh, I was like, you're just like your brother, huh? I was like, you just like to be silly. You like to laugh. And you just want to, you know, be silly too, right? And so I was just smiling at him and he was smiling so hard when I was engaging with him like that, that he was just shy of laughing. Like his, I, I think he maybe just wasn't quite ready to experience a laugh yet, you know, and like what a laugh feels like because that you feel a laugh on your your solar plexus area, right? I don't think like he was quite ready to just let that go and actually, you know, actually have a rolling laugh. But his little body was moving up and down and his little cheeks were flexing and he has little dimples. So just absolutely adorable. But a pure little angel has so much inside to get out of himself moment right where it was just like the first time that that was happening too where this little pure little angel just really needed to tell me so much about himself right like he was just really needing to talk to me and then once I you know was interacting with him it's it's on such a pure level that it's an experience that you know to this like four days later I still am relying on I'm still recalling that recounting on that not recounting, but counting on that as something in my cup to draw upon for fulfillment during difficult times in the day, right? During maybe difficult interactions with, you know, difficult people or unpleasant people or rude people, you know? And it's like, I'm able to go back to looking in the eyes of this little angel and, you know, his little pure smile and just his little conversation that he was directing toward me and really speaking to me and it's something that affects you for time afterward and it's something that you can draw upon and just fill your cup with for a pure reminder experience in life now I'm going to liken this to Marvin Gaye um, and this is my take on the album what's going on that album I'm going to kind of keep speaking on the song Flying Kind of Friendly Sky um, because I've been listening to that song like all day today. I've, uh, this is an example. I've had the song on repeat today because I will admit the song is very short. It's three minutes, 49 seconds long. So it's it's not, you know, a long listening experience. But this is one of the first times that I've kind of ever just had it on repeat because I, I just now that I've even given myself my own explanation um, and kind of, you know, like I said, it's the first time that I just for my self without any barriers, without any holdback of trying to not embrace or not accept what that message of that song is fully about, you know, without sugarcoating it. It's like, as I'm just allowing that song to relay its message to me, it's very, um, it's very big in the room, right? It just, it kind of fills the room with this is what that message is. But it, it, is a very unique sounding song. As I listen to it, I extra get all of the elements of pain that Marvin is going through. And the the sound, I will go back again to the uniqueness of the sound of just that song. And that segues me into liking Ning, the album What's Going On to this pure little experience that I had with my little angel. It's just that there is sometimes something so pure with inside of you that you just have to release. And that is exactly what the album What's Going On was for Marvin Gaye. Because I am seriously, today as I've been listening to Flying High in the Friendly Sky on repeat, I am so uh, in my mind connected to the material that he recorded really pretty much legitimately right before this album, right? I've been taking myself through the early stages of Marvin's career, through these podcast episodes that I've recorded, through hand in hand, you know, connected to a specific podcast episode. I'm therefore searching the internet for relevant images and relevant video footage. And part of what I found this weekend in that search um, relative to the Tammy Terrell 
uh, episode where I was discussing the Motown review, right? I Google the Motown review and I get all of the details about that. And I was able to come across this actual very rare, I, when I Googled it, when I Wikipedia, the Motown review, they mentioned that there had been some concert they gave in the Apollo theater in New York that did get filmed, but, and like for a little movie, but was never released at that time. And then it was actually also like never really authorized to be distributed in later years. But I came across the I I don't know who has this, but they have it up on YouTube. I was I was Googling the Motown review and then right just through all of the Internet results, uh, there was a link that took me to somebody's YouTube page that I then clicked play on the video. And just having found out that there was this concert that was recorded that took place at the Apollo Theater, you know, during those of, of the Motown review. And all of a sudden, it's the full concert. It is this concert that they were talking about. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And so then I got to see Marvin doing the Motown review. I got to see the Supremes, like a very, very early Supremes. This is pre the Supremes having a hit. They were singing some song that I've never even heard the Supremes sing before. Like, they didn't have a hit to sing, <laughs> you know. Um, there was the Contours. And then I think I did not watch the whole entire thing. It was like an hour long. It was an hour long of this actual show at the Apollo Theater. But it's just like this era of Marvin's music is what I have really been just um, celebrating, embracing, being in, surrounding myself with lately, right? As I'm recording podcast episodes and then I'm searching for material that relates to it. It's just really got me immersed. That's the word I'm thinking of in Marvin Gaye in this time frame. And there are some characteristics of Marvin Gaye in this time frame in his musical career. Um, but, and it's everything that I've touched on. It's the fact that Marvin starts out of the gate, starts recording with his artistic vision for himself, his ultimate artistic vision of himself, these old jazz standards, it's nothing original. It's not original material. It is Marvin trying to put his um, flair on it. And I actually came across my own personal copy of The Soulful Moods of Marvin Gaye, Marvin Gaye's very first album. I have that on disc, but I almost didn't even remember that I had that on disc because I have honestly never listened to that album multiple times. And so in the last week, I took that disc out. I had that in the car and I listened to it multiple times to where I really was starting to get the feel of those songs. And it was just like, that's Marvin Gaye putting his take on someone else's material. And so one thing that I was curious about when I literally just opened the CD cases, what am I going to find here is these liner notes. I was like, oh God, is this something written by Ritz? You know what I mean? And I pulled it out and thank God it was not. It was just literally, and this is what I always want. It was just what you would have gotten had you had the vinyl of this album from 1961. That's all that it was. It was what was originally inside of the, the album. And so it was this short little essay that was explaining that Marvin Gaye was this deeply talented, and this was very interesting, a drummer and a guitar player. I didn't know that Marvin played the guitar. Now, actually, I've come across all of these pictures from this time frame of Marvin holding a guitar. There are several pictures in a series of pictures that are of Marvin at the drums. And then it has him holding a guitar. And I didn't think that Marvin actually could play the guitar. I just thought he was, you know, taking a picture of himself holding the guitar. But it also explained that he is a very, just a mature young man and that he has been um, prepping for, you know, trying to deliver these songs for all of his life. And, you know, he's ready now. And it does state that Harvey Fuqua has primed and prepped him. And, you know, he's got this sophistication and this ability to, you know, bring a depth to these songs that is beyond his years. And 
it was just like, wow, that's a very, that's an amazing way to try to present Marvin at that very right out of the gate attempt. What I will say, I'm going to touch on that too, is that as I have listened to those songs, because I've felt a little bit bad about myself for wanting to say that it seemed like Marvin didn't really have confidence to try and deliver those songs because it's like, where is that coming from? Have I just kind of always heard that in somebody's essay about Marvin? And yes, I always have just really heard that in somebody's essay about Marvin because there's several things going on about that first album. Like I said, number one, I owned it. I did not even remember that I did. I came across my own inventory that I didn't even remember that I had. So that makes me understand. I have never personally dived deep into listening to those songs. There are, and as I was listening to the entire album, I realized, oh, this song is on the rare live and unreleased disc of the Marvin Gaye collection. And I never really pay attention to it. And oh, I've heard this song on random greatest hits compilation um, little playlists that I can find on Spotify or Rhapsody or wherever. But it's like I, and I honestly, I don't pay deep attention to those songs. I don't really listen to that song over and over again. So I have, last week, I really just was studying that album. And this is my take. Marvin seems like he's off in his own world. That's the way that Marvin is singing various of those songs. It's like, you almost feel like Marvin is singing with his eyes closed, which I do believe is something that he kind of did do a lot. As I am actually recalling, I do believe that that is a characteristic that Marvin had. Motown tried to coach him out of doing that over and over and over again. They had their little charm school that Marvin pretty much always refused to go to. But the coaching that I believe they were always trying to give to Marvin is to not sing with his eyes closed on stage because that people could see that he had his eyes closed. I think the reason why I'm struggling with feeling a confirmation on that is because I'm likening that to Miles Davis. I know that Miles Davis went to the extreme of actually just turning his back to the audience and playing his horn that way. But, you know, I know Marvin didn't do that. So what he must have done is face the audience, but closed his eyes. And as I'm listening to the soulful moods of Marvin Gaye, I get the impression that Marvin is off in his own little world as he's singing these songs. You get the impression that Marvin is singing with his eyes closed. Where And it really is, it's that Marvin is in his own world, not really paying much attention to the experience that he's giving to you. It's not, it's, it really feels like it's not so much about him trying to give an experience to you as he's just kind of off in his own world as he's singing these songs. And he's also doing something forceful with his voice. He's doing something forceful to hold himself back from his own voice. He knows some, he's coming into his throat. I'm doing this right now because I've, you know, just done something weird with my throat. You know, I'm, he's singing like that. He's making an effort. You know, he's like intentionally having to do that. And that's not the way that in years to come we will ever hear Marvin singing again. <laughs> so it's like this technique that it's like uh, kind of almost on purpose and maybe it was from doo-wop training. I don't know. Maybe that was a way of singing, you know, pre whatever he's going to do for the rest of his life. And the way that Marvin is just going to come into the comfort of his own skin, right? The comfort of his own voice. We, it's, it's interesting to listen to him on that album because it's, it's not the Marvin that you hear on the next album even. It's not the Marvin Gaye that you hear on I Want You. You know what I mean? It's just, it's amazing. It is such a glimpse, right, into, you know, someone that has not come into, you know, just feeling at home in their own skin, in their own voice. But this is all leading to the likening of my little angel story. We go from that, you know, his very first attempt where he is literally doing something odd with his voice that's like holding himself back. It's it's a it's a barrier that he's putting on his own delivery of his gift. And you know, then we move through all of the catalog of the 1960s and 
what I'm going to say is that Marvin just sounds a certain way, right? And Marvin is just singing certain material and the material sounds a certain way. I think that's probably the better way to put it is that Marvin is just singing material that sounds a certain way. And actually it sounds two ways, right? It sounds Marvin singing jazz, um, which is standards that are, you know, well-established years old, decades old, and he's just trying to put a fresh take on it. So that's nothing original. That's not Marvin Gaye's own material. That's Marvin Gaye's own twist on a song, but not Marvin Gaye's own material. And then the other hand-in-hand -hand part of his catalog going on at that time is he is singing material that is being, you know, kind of factory-lined, parsed off to him to, this is what you're recording this week oh, what did I, I was reading something where he was just like, he had to be in the studio, you know, to release stuff however many times a month. I think that was what he was saying, that like he had all of this pressure by Motown to be getting singles pressed out a certain number of times a month, which just seemed like a really ridiculous schedule. But it goes to show, we, I already pointed that out, where it's like they pressed out three separate standalone albums on him in April of 1964, right? So they were working him. And this was what he explained about that, is that as an artist, you don't want to have to be in the confines and in the constraints of being forced to feel creative, being forced to be in your artistic space, in your artistic mood, in your artistic ability, in your artistic inspiration, right? Like when you're going from allowing it to flow like that to it's on a schedule and it it has to happen, it's forced, it doesn't feel rewarding and satisfying. So in all honesty, it's like that's a really big part of that time frame of Marvin's experience of delivering us that material. And a lot of it is coming, like I said, you know, kind of factory lined, parsed out to him. He is writing some of his own songs. If This World Were Mine, he wrote that. Thank you, you know, Marvin, because that's about one of the most beautiful love songs ever written. So, you know, occasionally though, when we look at that whole entire um, vault of songs that, that happen in that decade, from 61 uh, through 69, right? Even through 70, because I do believe, I know an album comes out in 70, but I don't know if he actually had recorded it in 70. This is where I, I get into the technically what's going on is the first album that he released re slash recorded after Tommy Terrell died, because I do know that an album does happen in 1970, but I don't know if that album had kind of been recorded and, and happened, but sat on the shelf for a little while and then was released in 70. But even that album is still in the vein of what I'm talking about. It's just a sound that is associated with Marvin Gaye's material for a decade. And it is very, very, very much a fact, you know, that Marvin is not solely producing himself. Um, and he is just not solely in control of his material. And so though, but Marvin is an artist, he is a pure artist. And there comes a point in time, given just, you know, a, a tragic set of circumstances that have happened in his life, where he kind of, it sat him down for a little bit. Honestly, that's Tammy Terrell's death sat Marvin down for several years. Um, I was just reading that in the biography that, you know, and I, I just picked up the biography and I opened it and I was like, it it looks like this many pages would be about the time frame that we would be in this section of Marvin's life. And I just I started to read and I was about right. You know, I had to read a little bit forward and then I was right in this time frame. And Marvin is saying things to the effect of like for the past two years, he's refused to perform. And I think definitely like I believe he probably got scarred from performing from the fact of Tammy passing out in his arms like that. I think Marvin already struggled with performing so much, period, that went on top of all of that, <laughs> just his own really over the top level of stage fright, period, 
uh, and that's the only reason why I was kind of chuckling is then on top of that, not funny at all, but very tragically, you know, his musical soulmate on stage in the middle of doing that very difficult thing, you know, passes out in his arms. Um, I, I just think that was something that for a few years he absolutely refused to engage in. You know, it was to that level of traumatic that it was just an absolutely not. Will he do that anymore? So it sat him down. You know what I mean? And that's what I'm saying. Like after Tammy dies, this one album does come out, but I don't think that it was fresh material. I think it was something that had maybe been canned for a little bit and then it was released. Um, and, and Marvin really hadn't freshly, you know, in that time frame created that new material. Now I will check on that. And if I am incorrect, I will correct myself on that because it would be important. But even it, it kind of isn't fully important because even if he did release that album, fresh new material, let me let me just clarify this right now. And then I won't really feel the need to have to search this out too much. Let's say let's just for the sake of saying that he did after Tammy died, create a fresh album of new material that was released after her death before what's going on. The caveat to that, the the important part of that is that it wasn't Marvin Gaye written material, Marvin Gaye produced material. It was not an entire album of Marvin Gaye written and produced material. It was still the factory line parsed out and produced out material. So, and that is the reason why it still feels and fits in the vein of that entire decade before. <sighs> Let's go back to what I said a few minutes ago. Marvin Gaye is a pure artist angel, right? I'm like likening this now to my baby. There comes a point, especially when you're pure and you're an angel, right? You just will have stuff to get out of you. And guess what that stuff is going to be? It's going to be pure and it's going to be angelic. And that is what happened with the album, What's Going On. Marvin Gaye was just finally at this place where in, in a decade plus of making music that he was done being on that assembly line. He was done with the material, the catalog that he had been constrained and confined into. And the album, What's Going On, simply is, everyone our first exposure completely to Marvin Gaye's soul, right? It is our first exposure to unfiltered, unheld back, unproduced, unfactory lined, undictated, untold what it will sound like, untold what it will look like, untold how long it will be, indefinitely, did I say again, untold what it will sound like, Marvin Gaye releasing his soul to us and it was so pure and it was so angelic because it was just coming from that place that's what he had inside of him he was a pure and angelic artist there's there's some like my baby you know he's just pure and angelic and he just really had so much to say to me that day and it, it was kind of almost like the first time that he was just really feeling the need to really engage with me because he was really engaging with me. That baby started that conversation with me. It's not the first time I've ever seen my baby, right? I've been seeing him now for three months. But that was really the first time that just singling me out, he was needing to just have this very pure and angelic getting out of himself toward me message, right? And so that is exactly what the album What's Going On is of Marvin Gaye's. It is his first time that he is just releasing, you know, what is inside of him on his own, right? It's just like, okay, you know what? I've been at this now for 10 years. And I came across an interview recently and all of this research that I've done. It was a, a, a YouTube, so it was a TV recorded interview. So Marvin is speaking and I can see him speaking. Um, and the, the, he's just performed on a show. And this is something, I'm going to, I'm going to put this in here right now too. I'm coming across a lot of TV performances of Marvin Gaye in the 1960s. And I don't think I've yet seen one where he is legitimately singing. He's lip syncing. And the first time that I saw Marvin Gaye on Soul Train. So he's, he's at the Let's Get It On album and 
I bought my dad this box set collection of Soul Train performances. And so there's one disc that has the time that Marvin Gaye was on Soul Train when he was there to sing the Let's Get It On album songs. And so he's on there and he's singing Let's Get It On. Well, that's widely known that, you know, everybody was most of the time lip singing on the Soul Train. And so after he gets done with his performance, he says to Don Cornelius, because he kind of messed up a little bit. <laughs> And it was noticeable. And so when Don comes up to actually speak to him with a live mic, right? And he says, he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not used to lip singing. And Don like shushes him. Don looks at him and he's like, shh, you know, like, don't say that. <laughs> like Don, that was a really poorly hidden secret that people were not lip syncing. You know, like it's totally obvious that people get up on the soul train and they're lip singing. Sinking. Is it lip syncing or lip singing? You know, let's, I'm going to call it lip singing so that I don't have to struggle with saying sinking. Um, but that was hilarious because honestly, that was one of my, let me just put it like this. I hadn't been seeing all of this wealth of television performances that I'm coming across in these past few months of Marvin in the 60s. So I really did almost feel like Marvin was telling me that that was about the first time that he was ever having to do that lip sync. And I've come across all of these performances of him from the early 60s. And it's like I like I legitimately I would say I've seen 15, 20 I can't pinpoint the one so far where he is legitimately singing. He's lip singing. And this is a part of what he just refused to do anymore of once Tammy died. And just once he made his decision to take several years break from performing, he was not doing that anymore. He wasn't going on TV shows and making appearances. And so it was just kind of like, sometimes I just think that he like just put his foot down and he wasn't doing that shit back to though my thought so I saw this tv interview of him in that time frame in that 60s time frame that early 60s time frame and he's recently had a hit he's had a recent hit he has not yet had I heard it through the grapevine but he's had a recent hit and several hits in his entire career up to that point and he's been in his career just a little bit shy I think of eight years right because I heard it through the grapevine comes out in 68 and that's his million copy selling hit that stays at number one for seven weeks. I did just get that statistic. And so I'm happy to throw that out there. But this guy is speaking to him and he's just kind of bragging. He's trying to brag on Marvin like, wow, Marvin Gaye, you know, you got a lot of big hits. And Marvin actually right away kind of deflects that. And he's like, yeah, you know, well, I've actually never been blessed to have a number one hit. Um, you know, my hit is right now is doing very well, but I've never actually been blessed in my career so far to have a number one hit. So I don't really know what that level of, you know, success feels like. And, you know, it was just the guy was just like, oh, you know, but you've got so many other hits anyway. And he's like, and, it, and then the man even said, and, you know, that's just something that very few artists are able to achieve is getting all the way to number one. You know, like he was this man was really trying to work with Marvin, to, you know, keep him being built up. And but you could just really tell that it it kind of bothered, um, you know, Marvin that he this material, you know, just wasn't everything that he had had in mind, I think. Right. And so, you know, then he does really I'm as I was reading his biography yesterday, he, he it's classified as like he was in hibernation. You know, he just was retreating and he was in hibernation like he just was not definitely performing and that's widely known you know like he took kind of like just consistently several years and then you know I know that like here and there little tidbit performances kind of had to happen and they did happen you can get your hands on those but um they were tidbit they were this is going to happen but it, it's not a consistent thing so you know, years go by that consistently he is not putting himself out on TV lip singing and he's he's not performing on stage. And I think during that time, he's just really allowing himself to be right. He's just allowing himself to be. I think it's probably it, it, honestly not probably it honestly is. I'm, I can see this. It's his first time in his career that he's taking himself off of that assembly line because that is exactly what Motown is is um, known for. I think by themselves, they gave themselves that that association of 
factory line, right? Detroit, where all of the car factories were huge during that time. Factory line assembly, right? And they likened themselves to the equivalent of a, a car making factory. They were a music making factory. And so these couple of years here after uh, Tammy got sick, right? Marvin's just pulling back and he's hibernating and he's retreating. And he is just really, I think, letting himself be with himself and his his music and himself, himself as an artist. To where then finally, when he got to the stage of being back at the piano and being back into the writing and being back into the music creation, it's the very first time. And we're at 10 years, exactly, right? And when it's released, because the first album is released in 61, and what's going on is released in 71. There was just something else, though, that I had... Oh, yeah, there was a radio interview that I heard of Marvin at that time, where he was talking about how he kind of knew for himself that he wouldn't be considered like a really established artist until he had been in the game for 10 years and that he kind of knew that in this music game you kind of don't really get credibility and an icon status or you know just you know full respect until you've been in the game for 10 years so I just really feel like in Marvin's mind that that whole decade of the 60s just in his own mind like I said when that man is interviewing him on this tv show right after he's performed his career current hit like Marvin's putting it down he's like he's not feeling himself like he's there yet you know and I don't at all feel like he felt like he was there yet with the process of coming about making what's going on but I just feel like finally what happened is that Marvin no longer restrained his pure angelic message that he just really needed to pour out of himself and it is to the degree therefore when you listen to the album what's going on it is messages in that album that you can just kind of feel very touched by for hours days afterwards you know especially like a, a very first time of just sitting down and listening to it it's like oh my gosh I just heard something very pure and angelic here and so that is definitely what the whole experience of what's going on is about for me I really just lately here I'm balking at the being on the bandwagon that um let me go back. Let me, I'm going to say it like that, but then I'm also going to say it the way I phrased it in my episode yesterday. I say, and it seems to be the general consensus that what the story of what's going on is, is that it's telling the story of a soldier returning from the Vietnam War. And here's what I balk at, uh, tied to that, is since the time that I have encountered this album, right? And I first encountered it on disc and then, or excuse me, on vinyl. And then I got to get it on disc, which when I got it on disc, that allowed me to hear it in my ear, which is a requirement for experiencing what's going on. I just understood that for myself. When did I just, it's been in this past week. I realized it's like, oh yeah, it was, it was yesterday. It was yesterday because I knew that I needed to immerse myself into freshly, like right before I started to record, um, the album, what's going on. I just needed to listen to the album because I hadn't decided which song to start with yet. And it was like from note one of doing that, but I was doing it headphone jack into this phone so that it was coming into my ears it's like there is no comparison and there is no experience of hearing the album especially that album what's going on um like it is listening to it in the ear that is the requirement uh for your time listening to that album i will just i'm going to please very strongly request that that is the way that that album is experienced for a deep dive exploration of it because there's just stuff that you you don't hear the same without it flowing straight into your ear but I balk at the general consensus the bandwagon view the 
oh, we got to do a top 100 albums of all time, a top 100 albums of the 20th century, a top 100 albums of the last 50 years, a top, you know, like their whatever list. And they got to, of course, what's going on is going to be in the very high, like from zero to uh, number count there not not starting from 100 and whatever no disrespect you know to get yourself on the list but it's it's very high up toward the top of that list um now we need to describe it right so now we need to mainstream this now we need to just explain this in the mainstream way and the the phrase that always gets associated with this album but i'm balking at is concept album oh it was the first concept album recorded of course right by a black man <laughs> it's like that's really the thing that they try and make is the the connection there the the reason why this was just so groundbreaking is because it was the first concept album recorded by a black artist right like that's just something so it's like, no, I disagree. I'm going to put an X through that and I don't accept that. And I'm not limiting it to that because it's like, here's my question. And now I'm actually just going to use some language. So this is going to be labeled as an explicit episode. What the fuck does that mean? What the fuck is a concept album? Like I've never even, what the, what the fuck is that? You know, do you go on to Spotify and, and look for the category concept albums? You know, it's like, what the fuck does that mean? That has always been the way that I've heard that album described from the first time that I have it on disc and I'm being able to open up liner notes and I get to read somebody's essay that they are so excited that they got to just write about Marvin Gaye to get it included in this this disc release, right? And it's a concept album. And it's the first concept album by a Black artist. And it's it's just like, that's putting this thing in a box, that and that's not connecting it to Marvin Gaye, right? Like that's that's and like I, I don't even know what the fuck a concept album is. So that's doing nothing to keep this personal to Marvin Gaye, right? No, actually, what what's going on is let's let's finish our conversation that we've been having here. Is the very first time in Marvin Gaye's 10 plus year career at that point, right? It's been more than 10 years because he's been a musician for longer than he was at Motown. Um, but let's call it his 10 plus years of recording music. This literally, this is the reason why this is the turning point. This is the reason why it is such a deep experience and it is such a pure and angelic experience because it is the first time that Marvin Gaye is releasing what is in his soul of his artistic vision of his artistic gift of this gift from God level of and the level of responsibility that he feels he has with that you know what did he tell us it's the intelligence of God when he is purposefully and responsibly using his gift and that was the very first time that he just embraced every single element of that you know what I mean it was that's all Marvin Gaye. And so here's what I'm going to get to about like collaborating and and co-writing and all of this stuff. This is going to be a clarifier on my previous comments that I made about David Ritz and how I went so far. I know I got really worked up about it and I will rep for that. I'm going to back that. I'm never going to come down off of that, but I'm going to explain a little bit further, not just that I'm some irrational over the top Marvin Gaye fan and you know I just don't care about anything other than you know no it's there there's some reason there there's some rationale there um let's go to collaborating on things right so I was thinking I was putting this in the context of my own job I work in a, an environment where we have to collaborate a lot we produce competitive material and we need to you know bang that out and it needs to be at a very high quality well when we're doing that, I'm the senior person on the project that's handling the aspects of, of it that I'm handling. And I do get to collaborate with very excited and helpful and youthful and just what can I do and I will do anything and everything, you know, just gung-ho, great attitude helpers on the project, co-workers, helpers on the project, but they are my helpers because I'm senior 
on that. And at the end of the day, you know, we're going to collaborate and I am going to bounce things off of you. And I value your opinion, right? Because you might be able to see things from a fresh perspective or you, I will show you what I have just done. And I'm open to your feedback on it because possibly you can point out a way that I can make something look even better. But at the end of the day, if we're going through that process and if you and I don't agree on something, guess what though? We're going to do what I say because I'm the senior person. And at the end of the day, when this is gone out the door, it's mostly my name that's tied to it, right? If there's going to be some type of negative feedback, that's mostly going to be directed toward me. You know what I'm saying? If, if, when we get the accolades, I'm happy to share that. But at the end of the day, no matter what, the way that that final product went out looking is the way that I signed off on it looking. So that's what I'm talking about with Marvin Gaye and uh to just describe the collaborative process you know with Marvin Gaye's musical creation yeah you know there were there's a lot of there's a lot of working parts that go into making and recording and releasing music but at the end of the day and this is why I'm just saying to like understand who Marvin Gaye is in that entire process and who other people are in that process here I'm not even going to beat around the bush let's go to Ritz yeah, you may have come up with the lyrics and blah, 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 whatever the fuck you say that you were putting into the project. But at the end of the day, and especially at the end of that day, which was at the end of Marvin Gaye's career because it was nearing the end of his life. Mm, let's think about this. Do you think that the way shit would have gotten released under this is Marvin Gaye's project that there would have been a fucking thing that that fool had put into that song that Marvin Gaye didn't completely sign off on. And that's the fucking reason why we hear the end result of that song. Get your life full. Understand who Marvin Gaye is and who you are. There's no fucking way that there would have been something that that fool was trying to contribute if Marvin didn't sign off on it and agree that that matched what he was ultimately trying to create and deliver. And that if that fool had not been a part of the process, that we would not have still gotten that sound and just some fucking other lyrics than what that fool contributed to the process. So that's why I'm just saying. Understand and recognize who Marvin Gaye is and then understand who you are. Okay? So just, it's the end. But not quite so amped up and elevated <laughs> up like that. <laughs> when it comes to the overall collaborative process on Marvin's music recording, if it's not some type of a friction-filled experience like that, because you've got some kind of a hanger on that's worked his way a little bit too closely into your proximity, you know, you're working with talented other people, but guess what? At the end of the day, the final way that that project goes out is because I, as the artist, have signed off on what I'm releasing under being labeled that I produced it being labeled that I wrote a lot of that material, co-wrote a lot of that material, but this is my project, okay? This is my suite that I'm presenting. And please believe that I've signed off on this. So it's like, yeah, a lot of parts and pieces and unsung heroes and people that are appreciated, but at the end of the day, what we hear from that point forward in Marvin's career, that's Marvin Gaye, okay? That's a lot of parts had to be a part of it. We get this full, rich, I was reading it was the Detroit Orchestra or the Detroit, you know, whatever. But it was like a, a professional Detroit-based uh, orchestra, I will say it again, that is on that album. Yeah, Marvin could not possibly have performed all of that instrumentation, but... At the end of the day, I have a picture and I wish I could find this picture in color. Actually, I'm going to just have to scan it and upload it myself. But it is, it will perfectly paint the picture of what I'm talking about. Here, let me actually walk over to this picture right now. Um, it is a picture of Marvin Gaye standing behind the man that is conducting I see a woman holding, um, she's playing a cello. There's strings, right? There's strings. And there is the per there's two people standing in front of Marvin that you can tell are like more interacting with the musicians, but Marvin Gaye is standing behind that. That is, this is the way Marvin Gaye's music is made. He's there 
and he has the say, okay? The sound, maybe I can't get there and play that exactly the way you can. I can't pick it up and play it at all. But when we're done is when this sounds like what I'm needing it to sound like, right? That's all that I'm saying. And I'm saying it in a worked up way, <laughs> uh, you know, that I, I know it was not, you know, the day in and day out experience that working with Marvin was about. Um, so yeah, but this is obviously, I guess, just a preamble into anything further that I'm going to discuss about what's going on. But yeah, what we received for the very first time in this album with Marvin is his first unleashed experience of what Marvin Gaye has to say, what Marvin Gaye's music has to sound like, what Marvin Gaye's musical experience is about. And it's something that touches you and it is so pure and it is so angelic and you are just touched for hours, days afterwards, right? And let's keep this completely real. What is it? It's more than 40 years later now, right? It's that many years later now is how touched we are by this message. That's the reason why too, like, I don't even like to keep it linked to, oh, this is Marvin's response to the Vietnam War. Because, you know, if that was the case, there would not be the possibility that to this day, everybody, basically, that ever wants to critique this album in this day and age, in the moment about that entire album, you know, the way that I said it is like, wow, that was just a headline in the news, right? That just happened. That album is not about only the Vietnam War. That album is about Marvin Gaye for the very first time releasing all of that. And he is in that time frame, right? He was in that year. He was in this country. He was a citizen of this country. He was a black citizen of this country. And he was speaking about this country at that time. But that's not what that was about. Marvin was just speaking for the first time, you know? So it just happened to have so many correlations to that time frame, but it was not only about that time frame. And that is the reason why it is so transcend transcendental and just holds until this day is because what it is, is it's the first time that Marvin Gaye is expressing his full on message. So I'm excited. There's a lot to explore in this album. And really, I'm going to just give a, a teaser of what, where I'm going to go with this discussions of these songs in this album is the focus on the uniqueness of the sound of this music. And this is all Marvin Gaye for the first time. And it's just an experience like none other. All right, guys, we'll get into individual songs coming next. Well, friends, that's it for this episode. Did we have fun? I had fun. <laughs> Subscribe to our show so you never miss the enduring gifts of Marvin Gaye. And we're excited to announce that you can follow us on Pinterest at our page, pinterest.com forward slash Marvin Gaye underscore enduring underscore gifts. There, you can see our gorgeous picture boards for each podcast episode, among many others. These boards are full of images of Marvin, capturing key moments from each episode. We're making this a listening and viewing experience for you. So until next time, thank you for listening.